So it is my pleasure to introduce our next distinguished keynote speaker, uh, Andrew Zimmerman. Professor Zimmerman is professor of history at George Washington University. He is an award-winning teacher whose research focuses on modern Germany, the United States, and West Africa. His 2010 book, Alabama in Africa, Booker T. Washington, The German Empire, and the Globalization of the New South, traces the intertwined histories of Europe, Africa, and the Americas at the turn of the century, showing how the politics and economics of the segregated American South significantly reshaped other areas of the world. He is currently at work on a project whose working title is Conjuring Freedom, a Global History of the American Civil War. Now, I have a confession to make. I used digital search functions to produce this introduction. <laughs> um, but I also uh, got a little bit more context from a friend um, who knows Professor Zimmerman, uh, and whom I thought might have uh, written a prior introduction that he might be willing to share with me. Uh, what he told me was, uh, just think of the 10 nicest and most glowing things you could say about a person who also happens to be a totally brilliant historian and a wonderful teacher. If that doesn't work for you, you can read this text message. <laughs> Professor Zimmerman. That was an incredibly kind uh, introduction. Thank you. Um, I'll try to live up to it, although I don't think that's possible. Should I use a microphone or? You can use it on the left. Oh, oh, great. Okay. Um, so I'm so grateful to be here. It's been wonderful hearing about everybody's research, and I'm really grateful for the opportunity to talk a little bit about my research today, today too. The title of the talk I'm going to give is "What Conjurers and Communists Can Tell Us About Revising the Geography of Modern World Histories." Um, and like Manu, I'm talking about communism, and I think part of it is a lot of people thinking about communism as a way to theorize the international or, or the transnational, if everyone wanted to talk about it, um, but also conjure as a way to think about uh, the transnational. Let me just. Okay. So today I want to draw out some ideas from my current project a transnational history of the American Civil War that I hope will add to our discussion about the geography of modern world histories. And I'll also be talking about temporality a bit too. My earlier projects were transnational histories of empire. I used multi-sided archival and historiographical research and digital research um, also uh, to tell <laughs> histories that disrupted the often unintentional Eurocentrism of much imperial history. Too often, I thought, historians of empire uh, exaggerated the importance of European histories at the expense of the histories of the societies subjected to European rule. In doing so, they repeated the classic imperial gesture of uh, characterizing African, Pacific Islanders, and indigenous, indigenous Americans as peoples without history. Such accounts offered splendid denunciations of empire, or often, sometimes they offered horrible apologies for empire too, but more often splendid denunciations of empire, even as they reproduced the geography of empire. Against this imperial geography, I imagined a geography of quilting points that brought together multiple histories and historiographies, not just, for example, an African episode in European history, but also a European episode in African history. I've since become especially interested in what, may, what might be called global history from below, although I'm uneasy about using the spatial metaphor of above and below for thinking about class relations. I'm thus studying various plebeian transnationalisms to challenge the geographies and temporalities of empire and capital and much else. The actors in whom I'm interested had a manner of operating in space and time that differed from their elite, property-holding, politically empowered opponents. The flexible, even fantastic space and time of plebeian revolutionaries was, moreover, one of the powerful strategic resources that they possessed in their struggle against empire, capital, and so much else. I try to take my categories, geographies, and temporalities from these plebeian transnationalisms rather than from the structures of empire and capital that they lived in and often against. This means setting histories of empire in geographies of revolution rather than vice versa. An important inspiration for this is my co-panelist, Laura Putnam's concept of vernacular theories. 
Another is Cedric Robinson's conception of a black radical tradition that challenged slavery, racism, and capitalism, but was also independent and self-creative, not simply a response to slavery, racism, and capitalism. The African diaspora, of course, has a unique and particular geography, but it is one that may better serve transnational historians than the equally unique and particular geography of European and Euro-American uh, geographies of state, capital, empire, and whiteness. The US Civil War is a particularly good place to study the tension between plebeian transnationalisms and elite state-building nationalisms with their attendant diplomatic internationalisms. This is because within the Union itself, the, uh, the North and the Civil War. I don't know how much people know about the Civil War, and I'm trying not to presume anything, any knowledge, prior knowledge of the Civil War. Um, this is because within the Union itself, a pronounced conflict emerged between a national war to defeat secession and restore the Union on the one hand, and an international revolution to overthrow slavery on the other. Slaves had long fought against slavery in the United States and everywhere else, and they did not need the Confederacy to fire on Fort Sumter to begin a struggle for self-emancipation. Many Union soldiers, above all refugees from European revolutions, had little commitment to the US as a nation, but much to the democracy that they saw travestied in the slaveholding settler colony. In contrast, the Union leadership for much of the war insisted that it fought only to restore the status quo antebellum, with slavery continuing in states where it already existed. My own project recounts the Civil War from the point of view of plebeian transnationalisms, both African and European, showing how they helped win the war, even if they had to fight Union conservatives at the same time as they fought the Confederacy, and really the whole Union leadership, or much of the Union leadership. Uh, but rather than recount this story, I want to share two plebeian transnationalisms that I think are of special importance both for understanding the Civil War and for interrogating the geographies of history, which too often are borrowed from the geographies of state, capital, and empire. These two plebeian transnationalisms are conjure and communism. Conjure and communism are quite different from each other, but they have in common a radical incompatibility with conventional understandings, not only of politics and warfare, but also of how communities can and should function, how we can gain knowledge about ourselves and our societies, and how we can transform our world. They are each also, in their own way, incompatible with, tr tr uh, with conventional history writing, which has often reproduced the assumptions of the archives of plums. Above all, a belief in histories bounded by the nation, recounted as gradual linear progress, and explained by an unquestioned social order that historians often describe as context. The e efficacy of conjure and communism comes from the ability they confer on their practitioners and adherents to break the gradual time and confined space conventional to the modern state, to modern capital, and to modern history writing. They may appear occult or irrational for this reason because they stand at odds with the way the powerful understand and rationalize the world. This standing at odds is one part of their power, and it is what makes them revolutionary. So I'm going to talk about three people today. The first you probably haven't heard of, Guinea Sam Nightingale, a conjurer. The second, you probably have heard of uh, Karl Marx. And the third, <laughs> many of you have heard of John Brown, uh, the, the American Revolutionary. But first, uh, Guinea, Sam, Nightingale, and Conjure. Ah, Conjure some water here. OK, we can begin the Civil War with a cannon shot, but one more powerful than the ones conventionally thought to have begun the war, the ones fired by Confederate artillery on the Federal Fort Sumter in South Carolina in April 1861. The cannon shot that interests me boomed in West Africa in 1856, sending Guinea Sam Nightingale streaking across the Atlantic Ocean, landing directly in Boonville, Missouri. Upon arriving in what was then the major city of the primary region of slavery in Missouri, this human cannonball declared, quote, I'm a conjure man, and I'm telling you right now that I've come here to stay, and there's a new day coming for this town, end quote. <laughs> Nightingale became a widely respected healer and conjurer in central Missouri. Lucy Broadus, who had grown up in slavery in the area, would later claim that Nightingale and other heady persons, as individuals with powers like him were sometimes called, had been more important than the Union leadership in ending slavery. And I quote, it was them, she explained, that freed the slaves. They give a hand to Lincoln and them other big emancipator men so that they could bring it about a gift from the colored people of conjuration and power. End quote. Conjurers like Nightingale were ubiquitous in slave communities across North America, 
as were their counterparts elsewhere in the Americas, including practitioners of Vodou in Haiti, Obia in Jamaica, Santeria in Cuba, and Candomblé in Brazil. African-born intellectuals like Guinea Sam Nightingale constituted a minuscule, minuscule proportion of the enslaved population in the United States in the 1850s, but they were important intellectuals, healers, workers of magic, and political thinkers in slave communities across North America. Conjure was part of a working class political culture, a culture of enslaved people in the United States. Like their counterparts elsewhere in the Americas, conjurers helped enslaved people survive, resist, and sometimes, as Lucy Broadus uh, suggested, even overthrow slavery. Nightingale is especially interesting, and I think especially powerful, because his sojourn through the internal slave trade took him through two of the most powerful conjure communities in the United States, uh, coastal Georgia and southern Louisiana. And southern Louisiana not only had its own uh, traditions of, of voodoo, but also in the period Nightingale was in, and in the districts he worked, had a large uh, Haitian immigration, both of enslaved people and free, free people, who went there fleeing um, the, the, the revolution or being forced to, to, to flee the revolution. Um, most records of antebellum conjurers suggest that they were born in Africa, and at least part of conjurer's power derives from its connections to Africa. That was in Africa referred to as Guinea in Haitian Vodou, and I think that is one of the reasons that Nightingale called himself Guinea Sam Nightingale. Guinea was a concept he could have picked up in southern Louisiana. In the practice of conjure, Africa was not only a place that enslaved people or their ancestors had been taken from in the past, it was also a source of power in the present. The power of African conjure rests on a conception of space and time that makes the absent available in the present, not closed off in a distant past or geographically distant across, across an ocean. It is a model of history baked, baked, sorry, it is a model of history based on breaks, proximities, repetitions, rather than the gradual linear time that leaves our past ever more distant, ever less available. Conjure was also a technology or what historian T.J. Desh Obi calls tricknology. It was, for example, a technology of flight. Conjurers in coastal Georgia, where Nightingale was held as a slave, could fly through the air, sometimes all the way to freedom in Africa. Nightingale flew by cannon in the opposite direction. Conjure also facilitated flight from slavery, helping individuals avoid recapture by slave patrols or mauling by the vicious dogs that were part of the landscape of slavery. The terror of dogs not only kept individuals in slavery, but also whole communities. This is well known in the case, for example, of French slavery in Haiti, but it is also true in the United States. As an Arkansas ex-slave explained after the war, and I quote, if the colored folks had started an uprising, uh, the white folks would have set the hounds on us and killed us, end quote. During the Civil War, flight to the Union lines was one of the principal mechanisms by which slaves forced the Union to address the question of their freedom. Conjure was also a technology of fighting. Certain routes could render an individual, for example, immune to blows inflicted by white people. Frederick Douglass's famous victory in a fight with the vicious overseer and slaveholder was facilitated by such a route. Conjure could also aid collective rebellions. Nightingale's arrival in Boonville in 1856 coincided with a wave of slave insurrection, plots, and activism across the US South. William Webb, who had already used his conjure to protect clandestine political meetings of slaves, built a large network of information and activism in that year. There was also a wave of white militia organizing in the North in 1856. Conjure reveals a different geography of the Civil War, not a geography of the United States, uh, a geography, that is, of the unfolding freedom within a national exceptional nation. Instead, it is a geography that superimposed Africa on the Americas. The superposition was not just a fantasy projection, not just a set of metaphors, but rather a real source of power. Okay, so next I'm going to talk about communism. About 10% of the Union Army was born in the German states. Many of these soldiers were refugees from the crackdowns after the defeat of the 1848-49 revolutions in Europe. A small but significant portion were communists, members of the Communist League, the organization for which Marx and Engels had written the Communist Manifesto. Like conjurers, they brought to North America an international revolution that stood at odds with, but also sustained the war for the Union. Uh, they included 
Uh, August Willig, for example, who challenged Marx to a duel at one point, but also who also uh, was a brigadier general who helped save the day at the Battle of Shiloh for the Civil War buffs in the room. Um, it also included the controversial but much beloved Franz Ziegel, um, who's probably the best known of the German generals uh, in the Civil War. Marx's close friend and comrade Joseph Weidemeyer uh, also served as an artillery officer in the Union Army in Missouri, as he had in the Prussian Army before he quit to join the 1848 revolutions. Uh, especially in the western theater of the war, that is around the Mississippi River, uh, beginning in Missouri, communists and other German capital, anti-capitalist radicals exasperated Union officials by their willingness to arm and fight alongside self-emancipated slaves at a time when this was contrary to Union policy and indeed illegal. But communist 1848ers did not bring ready-made mod lessons or models to the Civil War. Their revolution had been a failure after all, and the politics and philosophy of the Communist Manifesto was, some of them thought, and I think, partly responsible for that failure. The Manifesto had urged communists to cease fighting bourgeois rule and instead accept as a necessary stage on the road for feudalism, accept capitalism as a necessary stage on the road from feudalism to socialism. During the 1848-49 revolutions, most communists rejected the stagist gradualism. And indeed, in 1848, the bourgeoisie showed itself to resemble the hated reactionaries of popular communism more than the inherently revolutionary class depicted in the Communist Manifesto. The defeat of the 1848 revolutions left Marx searching for ways to imagine a revolutionary politics that would abolish present misery by means more effective than waiting for future economic developments. His search would continue more than a decade until the outbreak of the US Civil War. The defeat of European revolutions scattered many communists and other anti-capitalist revolutionaries into exile, often to the United States. When the Civil War broke out in 1861, they would learn new ways to think about revolution from the, from the struggles of the enslaved against slavery. Even before the Civil War, in his 1852 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte, a text, by the way, that was published first by Joseph Weidemeyer, the Missouri artillery colonel, in a German language journal in New York City. So it's first a text for, he's for, written for the exiles. Um, in 18th Brumaire, Marx gestured towards a temporality that broke with the linearity to which he and Engels had once subscribed. In 18th Brumaire, Marx posited that proletarian revolutions exist outside the narratives in which the bourgeoisie remained trapped. These narratives are famously tragedy and farce. Uh, the proletarian revolution, it's, it's, I think it's an important point that Marx, when he says all history is you know, that the, the repetition, it's bourgeois history that's a repetition. It's very clear that proletarian history for Marx is not a repetition in that way. The proletarian from revolution for Marx breaks with history. Uh, quote, the social revolutions of the 19th century cannot draw its poetry from the past, but only from the future. I think that's my favorite Marx quote. I love that one. Um, that is, the proletarian revolution reaches from the present to the future, not to arrive there more quickly, but rather to bring non-existent poetry, and I think we should read poetry very broadly here, into the present. Marx began intuiting what Nightingale and other conjurers already knew. Temporality is but one way of connecting the absent to the present, a way that, by naming the absent as the past or the future, assures that it will never impact the present. Marx, Marx searched for magic and found it, perhaps not surprisingly, in, in the Civil War in the United States. Precisely where Guinea Sam Nightingale and many other conjurers also practiced it. By 1864, the progress of the American Civil War had brought Marx out of the political funk in which he'd found himself since the failures of the 1848-49 revolutions. Many of Marx's most unpleasant pronunci pronunciations about other communists were written in this 1850 period when he's, you know, understandably despairing about revolution, but the Civil War changed that. Marx threw himself into the foundation of the International Workingmen's Association, an organization of socialist, communist, anarchist, and trade unionists, remembered today as the first international. For many, the successful end of slavery in the United States was not only a victory in its own right, but also presaged further victories over wage labor. When Marx wrote to President Abraham Lincoln to congratulate him on his reelection, on behalf of the First International, he predicted that as the American War of Independence initiated a, view, a new era of ascendancy for the middle class, so the American Anti-Slavery War will do for the working classes. <laughs> the next year, the organization, the First International, gave the stars and stripes, not the red flag of communism, 
pride of place at its annual festivities to mark the triumph of the United States <coughs> over the slaveholding confederacies. And just a sidebar here, a lot of historiography, um, when it deals with Marxist, Marxism or Marxist interpretations of the Civil War, sees it as a bourgeois revolution. And I think that's an, you know, regardless of what Marx said, I think that's an incorrect interpretation. I think it was a working class revolution. And as that passage indicates in a lot of other passages too, Marx himself thought it was a working class revolutionary and a revolution. If you think about something like Du Bois's Black Reconstruction, which is self-consciously in dialogue with, um, with, with Marx and developing Marx, um, it's also, he also speaks about a general strike of the enslaved, which is obviously, to call that a bourgeois revolution would kind of stress, <laughs> strain the definition of, uh, of bourgeois. Um, such enthusiasm by Marx and other communists for the United States did not survive the disappointments of Reconstruction. But the Civil War did continue to inspire Marx and many of his comrades. In the preface to the first volume of Capital, which Marx published in 1867, he repeated the sentiment that he had expressed in his letter to Abraham Lincoln, that the Civil War had been a signal for workers of Europe to rise up, or a signal for workers in Europe anyway, I think probably to rise up. <laughs> Marx expanded on a by then conventional use of slavery as an analogy to explain wage labor. In Capital, he suggested that where the theft of labor was obvious in slavery, it was hidden by the wage relation in so-called free labor, where capitalists seemed to be giving wages rather than taking labor. Marx implied that just as slaves had emancipated themselves, wage workers might do the same. Uh, the movement then emerging in the United States to limit the workday to eight hours, which Marx regarded as a direct outcome of the Civil War, provided the basis for Marx's broader discussion of the struggle of workers for autonomy. Um, and this is a point that Raya Dunyaskaya, I think, was the, first, was the first to make. For Marx, the struggle to limit the working day represented the largest struggle of workers to keep part of their lives for themselves, to resist spending their entire waking existence creating value for their employers, as slaves had been forced to do. The Civil War became a new paradigm of revolution for Marx, he would make this point explicitly in his analysis of the Paris Commune, titled Civil War in France, and replete with references to the US Civil War. The Commune for Marx was an episode in the same struggle as the American Civil War, what he called, and I quote, the war of the enslaved against their enslavers, the only justifiable war in history, end quote. The geopolitics of the Communist International was not the geopolitics of interstate warfare, but transnational revolution, the enslaved against their enslavers, wherever they might be within or across states. Like Conjure, communism rested on a geography and temporality distinct from that of state, empire, capital, and whiteness. It is an internationalism, but it is also rooted in a very specific geography, that of the workplace, what Marx calls the hidden abode of production. Conjure creates a power by, Conjure creates a power by connecting Africa and the Americas in a politically efficacious manner. Communism does the same, creates a power by connecting the international and the workplace in a politically efficacious manner. The geographies and temporalities of conjure and communism, and no doubt the geographies of many other occult plebeian powers, give us a set of starting points for world histories that, at the very minimum, differ from, profoundly from those of the dominant. All right, so in the last section, I want to talk a little bit about John Brown and the Stars and Stripes. It's too easy, and therefore not illust illustrative enough, to contrast the geographies of conjure and communism with, say, the geography of Henry Kissinger or other such prominent men. Let me begin to conclude, then, by looking at a figure who more commonly figures as part of the revolutionary history of emancipation, John Brown, the anti-slavery militant who fought in Kansas and led the 1859 raid on the federal arsenal in Harpers Ferry, Virginia. Brown developed a deep anti-slavery that drew from Christianity, but his political strategies and military strategies rested on African-American and European revolutionary traditions. In 1849, Brown traveled through Europe to study the revolutions that had just been defeated there. When he returned, he enlisted the support of a number of refugees from these revolutions, especially a British colonel who had fought, fought in Italy under Garibaldi, Hugh Forbes. Brown also began working with black militias that emerged in northern states in response to a newly strengthened Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. John Brown never implemented his revolutionary plan. And so one of the things I'm doing, I mean, the Harper's Ferry is often seen as what John Brown was planning all along. And in fact, it, it wasn't, I mean, it was, it was related, but, but, but it was, we shouldn't see that as the plan. 
Um, the plan was much better. Um, <laughs> founding a kind of, the plan was founding a kind of guerrilla polity in the Appalachian Mountains. This range, stretch, stretching from Georgia, Georgia to Maine, was already an important route on the Underground Railroad. Brown proposed turning this route into a revolutionary state with a constitution that he wrote in the name of, and I'll quote the, the preamble, we the citizens of the United States and the oppressed people who by a recent decision of the Supreme Court are declared to have no rights which the white man is bound to respect. Brown's referring there to the 1857 Dred Scott decision that declared African Americans to not be citizens. Um, and then to continue the quote, um, together with all other peoples degraded by the laws thereof. Brown's is an alternate polity to be sure, defined in part by the exclusions of the United States. It also offers a revolutionary geography, but it was also a polity within the space time of the state that Brown also fought against. Brown thus declared his revolutionary constitution to be non-revolutionary, not to be, quote, construed so as in any way to encourage the overthrow of any state government or of the general government of the United States and look to no dissolution of the Union, but simply to amendment and repeal, end quote. Brown soldiers would even fight under the stars and stripes of the United States, quote, the same that our fathers fought under in the Revolution, end quote. In 1858, uh, in, in May, so this is m m about a year and a half before the, the Harper's Ferry Raid, uh, the black anti-slavery militant Martin Delaney, uh, who actually writes in his novel Blake just amazing things about conjure too, but I can't go into that. Um, the black anti-slavery militant Martin Delaney helped Brown organize a convention in Chatham, Canada to ratify the Constitution for his revolutionary state. Chatham, a terminus on the Underground Railroad, just over the border from Detroit, had a large and well-organized African-American community, many of whose members were fugitives from slavery in the United States. Holding a convention at Chatham under Delaney's auspices made sense both because of the large number of possible African-American recruits for the revolution and also because Chatham provided a more secure location than any US city would have. But it also put Brown in an environment that challenged uh, the patriotic assumptions behind his belief <coughs> that in overthrowing slavery, he was restoring rather than transforming the true meaning of the United States. Several black Chatham residents at the Constitutional Convention objectively objected particularly to fighting slavery under the US flag. Too many of them, one recalled, and I actually just learned who the, the one who recalled this was a, a, an African a formerly enslaved African American gunsmith who had moved to Chatham and built guns there and was met regularly with Brown because he was repairing Brown's guns for the, for the upcoming revolution. Um, so this, this, this gunsmith uh, said too many of them thought that uh, they carried this emblem on their backs, the stars and stripes scars from whippings they had received while enslaved in the United States. I'm not sure if that came across well, but they were, Brown said we're gonna fly the stars and stripes, and this person said, we are, a lot of us already have stars and stripes on our back, and we're not gonna fight under that flag. Um, and by stars and stripes, they meant whipping scars. This, too, is a geography of US internationalism, that kind of imprint of the stars and stripes on people's backs. Um, Brown's closest European advisor, Hugh Forbes, identified a second problem in Brown's strategy to found an anti-slavery state in Appalachia. And those of you who know the historiography on John Brown, Forbes is often presented as a, as a villain and as a betrayer, and I think that's not, that's not correct, but there's, I mean, I'm glad to discuss it too, but I, I won't go into that here, because that's, <laughs> that's not totally relevant right here. Um, <laughs> Forbes was a European revolutionary. He remained a European. He went back and fought after, you know, when he a bit broke with Brown, he went back and fought um, first in Poland and then back in Italy again, too. And the problem that Forbes identified with Brown's uh, plan was a lack of black leadership. Lord Byron's words were on the lips of many black and white revolutionaries in those days. Quote, hereditary bondsmen, know ye not, who would be free themselves must strike the blow. But to many whites in the US, self-emancipation meant what was commonly called the horrors of Santo Domingo, that is the Haitian Revolution. Brown himself clearly favored armed insurrection by enslaved African Americans, and a number of African Americans fought under Brown's command. But this was not enough for Forbes. In New York, Forbes made contact with an all-black organization planning their own armed struggle against slavery. They wanted no help from other white men, one of John Brown's associates explained disapprovingly continue the quote, and some of us spent a good deal of misdirected intellectual effort 
in the endeavor to prove that somewhere in the historic past, their race had been one of the ruling forces of the world." End quote. This connection to Africa as a source of power, political and otherwise, relied on the geography of conjure, even if it's unlikely that these New Yorkers did any conjuring themselves, but who knows. Forbes managed to get Brown, Brown's arms suppliers to cut him off, and the revolution never happened. The Harper's Ferry, the year and a half later, was sort of a version of it, but not, 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 this, not the same plan. The attempt to carry out a revolution inside the time and space of the nation state was surely not the only strategic flaw of John Brown's plan, but it was one of them. All right, so now the real conclusion. Um, John's Brown raid, John Brown's raid and the US Civil War illustrate the practical, the strategic importance of geographies and temporalities. In fact, construing geographies and temporalities is one of the ways we historians don't just write about, but we repeat histories. In his 1988 SF novel, Fire on the Mountain, uh, Terry Bison gives an alternate history of the John Brown raid. Does anybody know that novel by chance, Fire on the Mountain? Well, I recommend it to everybody. Um, uh, so in the novel, uh, Brown, in collaboration with Harriet Tubman, does manage to start a slave insurrection in the South. The novel describes an alternate present revolting, resulting from that alternate past, one in which a free socialist republic emerged in the South, leaving a backward capitalist North striving to catch up. As Mumia Abu-Jamal writes in a preface to this, this novel, quote, there are thousands, maybe millions, of alternative universes where every probability has its potential fruition. If that is so, there is one where Fire on the Mountain is not a sci-fi, but a history book on what was, end quote. These kinds of speculative, ge speculative geographies are also ones employed by conjure communism um, and Bison and Mumia Abu-Jamal, if not by John Brown. We gain new worlds and new temporalities in geography by then taking Lucy Broadus' advice to look beyond, quote, Lincoln and them other big emancipator men. Thank you. So we have about 10, 15 minutes for questions maybe before our break, so. Uh, thanks, Andrew, for a great talk. Um, uh, I guess I have a quick comment and then a question. First, the comment, uh, I, I'm super grateful that you, you included Canada in the story of the U.S. Civil War. I mean, that's awesome. It's, the only thing is it's not French Canada. That's yeah. Awesome. Uh, um, I really, um, I'm thinking a lot about the scales with boxes and containers and, mm -hmm. and transportation, travel, that kind of stuff. Um, and I really like your, your frame or your box or your container um, and it's four corners, so mm -hmm. the square and the rectangle, right being the individual, the nation state, the region, and the world, mm -hmm. right? Um, I was hoping you can speak a bit more about uh, the importance of that kind of quad quadrilation, mm -hmm. or, some, or some of the challenges, because you're clearly very rooted in the individual. This is something David and I were talking yeah. about yesterday. Yeah, that's, what, that's a great. I never thought of the, um, the that quadrangle. That's a, that's a, I like that image very much. That's good. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm very interested in individuals, and partly I'm writing this as a partly because it's a civil war topic. So, it, it, but for a, a non, I mean, also I have an academic to read it too. I'm special interested in academic to read it, but also for for a general audience. Oh, well, academics also. are going to read it. Yeah. <laughs> and the uh, and the um, and the way I think about the geography is yeah. First of all, looking at individuals and. Um, and different kinds of individuals. So John Brown and Karl Marx, very well-known individuals. Um, Lucy Broadus, like, I don't think as, you know, not, not written about since the 1930s when, when WPA uh, narratives were, were collecting her. So thinking about and trying to, to, to give three-dimensional individual, a variety of three-dimensional individuals for sure. Another part of the geography that I didn't really allude to here, though, is, um, is, the, is regions, is small towns. So places that don't seem transnational, I like very much. So my, like my favorite places in, in the US, Chad and Canada is one I talked about. Boonville, Missouri is another one. Um, it's just a fascinating, it's a fascinating place to visit. Now that's where Gaby Sam Nightingale lived and there was some important, anyway, there's a lot, a lot happened there. Helena, Arkansas is really important for me. Hoboken, New Jersey, um, 
which I just visited there, and it's like it's not no longer a hotbed of like African American anti slavery and children. <laughs> 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 but they have, you know, they have a lot of espresso bars right now, but it's but it's but, it's, but these kinds of like I mean even among the names they sound so like Bungo especially just yeah. so um, but it's but it's possible one of the things that's that that makes possible. Um, is not only to find like a different kinds of like peripheral transnationalisms. So these are, I mean, a lot of these, like a lot of them, German communists are there because they can't afford New York, New York real estate. They can't afford the rent there, and they have, and they don't want to move there, and they see it as backwards and peripheral. But then they develop these amazing, um, made amazing scenes. So one of the reasons I'm, I just wanted to focus on these small places is for that. But it also makes it possible, like in Boonville, Missouri, to read every single document that I could find on Boonville like, without having to make any, I could read every book written about Boonville, every newspaper, every archival document. If I found more, I would instantly run out and read them. I, mean, I, don't, I don't fool myself that I found everyone, but everyone that I could find. And so it becomes possible to be very global, but then also to just do this very regional, local stuff and never have to overlook any detail. Um, that's how I found out, I had no idea to write about Conjure at all. I, mean, I was just reading everything about Boonville and Guinea Sam Nightingale is, I mean, Recently, a Boonville author wrote a children's book about him because he's still remembered as an important figure. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I can do Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, I just found it really fascinating. Thank you. Um, I have a question that I guess gets to the, the kind of the temporal and then the geographical sort of mm -hmm. story that you told us about these, these individuals. And I'm thinking uh, so the communists and the controllers, in different ways, in different times, uh, they come from. By and large, it's a European and African movement mm -hmm. into the US, right? Yeah. They bring these visions of the future right. that are politically powerful. Yes. And, and then Brown sees himself very much as an American. Yes. And his vision for the US is totally built on the past in a way, right? Mm -hmm. Because he wants, no, we're going to go back to the way that he imagines, yeah. right? The US should have been, or that was the original recipe. So I guess I'm asking, is there a reason why the movement from the outside is about the future and is about this kind of aspirations for something that we can't exactly see yet yeah. and is in defiance of the reality that people can usually spot around them or you know, the predominant narratives. Um, and then those from the US are about, well, it's just about, if we can fight about the past as we try to recreate the future. Yeah. And then, and then I guess it's connected, but maybe separately. With communist conjurers, would there be other possible categories there? Yeah. Um, or is it just the conjurers and the communists? That we yeah, do? that's good questions. Um, the last one first is quick. The conjurers and communists are the ones that I found to be most important, also because I see them as like theoretical sources for my for my work too. Mm -hmm. But definitely, I see them. This is like a category of, I mean, I call it like occult plebeian powers. You know, some, I'm not sure, but I mean, they're not really occult to the people who do it. But but yeah. it's but, and to think that these they're there, and I hope that I mean they're they're they're. An infinite number of, of occult, I hope, an infinite number of occult Libyan powers that would be relevant for different for, 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 for different kinds of history. The U, it's interesting because Brown, I mean, as a very typical U.S. patriot, imagines it's really he's imagining a future like the U.S. is, but it's going to finally realize the, the ideals of freedom inherent in the United States. Um, I mean, this is something that I started thinking about. Like after you know after the, the 2016 election, like, like oh my God, the, the ideals of freedom inherent in the United States are being destroyed. Like, well, I mean, <laughs> a, yeah, again, yeah, and um, and so I mean Brown and a lot of you know a lot of the 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 the, 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 the Americans, the, the, the American born Americans, um, they think they're they think they're realizing the, they, they they think they're, they're realizing the future, but it's also really a um, a past still. One thing I didn't get to talk about also because I just came across it, the, the same gunsmith that criticized Brown for the flag also said, Brown responded and he said, I want it to be, um, I want to be like Christ, like it's just okay to, just to die and to redeem a people. And it's interesting because the, the reigning biblical model in Conjure um, was Moses, not, not Christ. And Moses as the, first of all, as an African conjurer, which, which he was, um, and also as a, as a redeemer of his people. And of course, Harriet Tubman was, was Moses. And so we think of like Moses and, and Christ as two different figures. So there's a religious aspect too, which is, I didn't mention there. Yes. Um, thanks. Uh, so I guess I wondered if you could speak a little more about what the relationship is between conjure and communism. Is it like an elective affinity or is it you know, more practically related historically, empirically? And I guess the reason I'm wondering is, 
because what seems unmentioned in this, and I'm sure you'll be able to hit it down in a larger part, but you know, the way that Marx describes capitalism, particularly in um, part four of chapter one, volume one of capital, <laughs> yeah. um, is you know, using words like about magic, um, you know, metaphysics, uh, tables with brains that have grotesque ideas, and the, 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 that sort of stuff. So um, it seems like that is um, inherent to Marx's critique of capital, and I wonder if you know you're sort of implying that this um, this is what's going on in this relationship between country and communism is that they are both sort of um, vehicles for a kind of anti-capitalism that you know does that kind of penetrating into the hidden abode. Yeah. Um, or or perhaps there's some other. Yeah, no, that's, I mean, the default, what I, what I want to find is a, is a strong intellectual relationship, and I, haven't, I, and I haven't found that yet. What I definitely find is that African American, enslaved African Americans, and, um, and German, and many German Union soldiers, especially in, in, the, in, the, in the, we now call the Midwest, in the places like Missouri, recognize each other as, as allies. Um, there were a lot of, I mean, a lot of native-born whites in Missouri were often pro-slavery, and you know, the Union, because it was a slave state in the Union, like the Emancipation Proclamation didn't, didn't apply there, and there were, there were um, you know, there were a lot of, of white Missouri officers who supported slavery. So if an enslaved person was gonna flee to Union lines, um, it was a pretty good bet if they were, if they had German accents, um, that these, these would be safe people. Also, when Union soldiers were trying to buy, like, Groceries and things they would buy from German grocers, so they because they knew they wouldn't be poisoned. Um, I don't want to like reify Germanists because like Germans also <laughs> fought for the Confederacy. Germans owned slaves. There were German reactionaries. That, I mean, so it's a but it's but it's it's a it's a kind of it's a kind of ethnonym as a political identity, which is not totally accurate, but you know it's a, a, good, a handy rule of thumb when you're you know fleeing and <laughs> German and, and Germans uh, and Union soldiers in general knew that African Americans would be would be good allies. Um, not just as um, you know, as but you know, not just as um, you know, people who give them food or supplies, also that, but also in, in fighting. Even and there, there, there's actually in, the reason I got interested in Boonville is there's a time when a, an African American, an enslaved man, found out that a slaveholder was leading an attack on Boonville, and he ran to the Boonville German troops. They welcomed him. Gave this is in 1861, so this is like not allowed at all, gave him a gun, and he could pick out his slaveholder, who was the, the colonel, and shot him dead, and, and then and saved the day, because it you know, they, they was not like a super trained Confederate column, so losing their, their commander was kind of, they, they, they just, they, they fled. And um, that's, that's the kind of example I, I find really interesting. I mean, I would love to know what they were talking about, I just don't, I don't know. The, I mean, there's a long tradition of, of European magic thinking too, and and that's I think that's what Marx is building on in in Capital. But there's that one wonderful um, set of articles by um, Wilhelm Peetz, I think his name is, on the fetish and the way that comes out of a European encounter in um, in Guinea, actually, in, in in West Africa, and the way that becomes such an important concept for for the, for, for Europe. So there isn't for European social thinking. So there is a connection. To, let's say African intellectual history um, that way, but it's I don't think it comes from Conjure directly. But I'm still working on it. I would like it. My desire is that it does come, <laughs> <laughs> and I have to. It's hard. It's, it's a real challenge writing about people that I just I love the people I'm writing about, and it's much easier to write about people I don't like and then try to you know be, be charitable to them. I have to really check my wishful thinking. <laughs> yeah, money.
ritual or annual conversation with mm-hmm. it. And it's by form of weatherness. Yeah. Right. Um, so I think it's an interesting, uh, I mean, I don't know if you know about the John Brown Society still exists. Yeah. They have an annual thing at his, uh, um, the, his death site in, you know, whatever. In, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or whatever. In Timbuktu, Adirondacks. It's yeah, what it is yeah. Like. And it's, yeah. but it's all for the weatherman. Yeah. Right? And there's something about that, um, that yeah. filter. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Which I think is interesting. No, that's really important. And I mean, one thing here, I'm, pre- I'm, it's, I'm presenting the critique of Brown because it's, 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 har- it's harder. But it is really, I mean, his image as like the, you know, the white person who is, doesn't just wring his hands about injustice, but actually gives his life to fight injustice, is a really important model for the weatherman, for, I mean, Malcolm X has a great line where he says, you know, if you want to know where a white person stands, ask him what does he think about John Brown. And if they say, well, I don't, you know, I mean, I'll get me wrong. But, and so, and that, I, I agree with that, that, that test, you know what I mean? So the critique I want to make of John Brown is like as a, a dialectical, and if you can be comradely across, you know, many generations um, to say, that was good, and you know, like a further effort, get more radical, no, you know, not, not, it's not a, it's, and, and that, that kind of critique. I think, to criticize myself, I don't think I made that clear enough here in my presentation, I just used it to contrast contra communism. But yeah, I think that's really important, and I totally endorse the Weatherman's use of him as a usable past. But, but the Weatherman, in relation to the Black Panthers, repeats the structure that you're talking about. Yeah. That's, that was my Oh, right, right, that too. No, absolutely. And there was, I don't quite know the, the relationship between the Weathermen and, it sounds like a, it sounds like a, like a neo-Nazi organization, but the White Panthers, we, we weren't, they were, they endorsed the, the Black Panther program and recognized their leadership. And they were connected somehow with the band NC5. Um, anyway, it's a, it's a history I don't quite know, but, um, but that's another kind of model that was, that, that is, I think. And it's a real problem. I mean, that's, for me, one of the present questions that's driving this is like, how do you have a multiracial struggle without Repeating the very kinds of power that you're that you're um, you're trying to fight against too. So before the plenary actually breaks out, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I want to suggest that we all take a break for coffee, um, and uh, that we return here after I've tried to figure out how to turn the heat on. <laughs> Please join me in thanking. <laughs>